Greetings to one and all. I extend my warmest welcome to everyone to the most awaited lecture, that is the 28th M.A. Thomas Memorial Lecture, the day we commemorate and honor the founder of the Ecumenical Christian Center. First, let me highlight the order of today's program. First, we will witness a glimpse of ECC, that is a short ECC documentary, which will be followed by a welcome address from the director, Professor Dr. Matthew Chandran Kunel. Introduction of the speaker by Professor Dr. Sarasu Thomas, the vice chairperson of ECC, and then the presidential address by His Grace, the most Reverend Dr. Theodosius Malthoma Metropolitan, the chairperson of ECC. And the lecture will be presided by Tirumeni. And towards the end of the lecture, Reverend Sukumar Babu, the program executive of ECC, will deliver a word of thanks. I'm so happy to see on the screen many uh, people who were leading the center, especially the former directors and all other well wishes of ECC. As I said, we, will, we would like to present to you a short documentary of the ECC. to the Ecumenical Christian Center, the ECC. Hi, I'm Shannon, and I also work here at ECC. I chose to work here because I love what it stands for. Peace, harmony, no matter your religion, caste, or creed. I'm from the US, from Harvard University, and I do interreligious dialogues and interfaith events here. ECC rests on 30 acres of land and is a green campus. As you can see, it is a safe, secure, and a friendly place to be. ECC was founded in 1963 by the late Reverend M.A. Thomas from the Marthama Church. He was a visionary and called for the unity of humankind. He said, as long as the center exists, its prime message is that humankind is one, irrespective of caste, creed, color, or sex. And that vision remains true to this day. It conducts dozens of international and domestic conferences, workshops, and events, all for promoting unity and interreligious harmony. This is the ECC emblem. It symbolizes people, all different kinds of people, holding up the world. And isn't that a beautiful emblem and symbol to live by? Reverend M.A. Thomas came into this world as a gift of God. M.A. Thomas Hudson lived in the world to establish a ecumenical Christian center in Whitefield, Bangalore. And that is his gift to the world and to the generations. Reverend M.A. Thomas got ordained as a priest of the Martha Church. But then he grew up in ministering to the whole world. Because of his discernment of the will of God, he decided that the horizon of his ministry should be wide enough to serve humanity as a whole. It is his dream that made the Ecumenical Christian Center Whitefield a reality. What he visualized, he concretized in establishing this center. And this center has become known to the wider world. And as a result, people from all continents of the world, far and wide, come over to the ecumenical center 
to catch the vision of M.A. Thomas Achan and also to reflect on it. And therefore, the Ecumenical Christian Center, Bangalore, even now exists as a center that radiates the vision of the great person, Reverend M.A. Thomas. The ECC celebrated its Golden Jubilee in 2013 where the Vice President of India, Mohammed Havan Anzari, was the chief guest, along with many other dignified. Mr. Rowan Williams, the Archbishop of Canterbury, visited the ECC in 2010. Sri Jai Prakash Narayan visited in 1972, and the Patriarch of the Antioch visited in 1982. These are the past directors of ECC. Reverend Dr. M.A. Thomas, founder and director. Reverend Dr. Casey Abraham, director from 1980 to 1986. Mrs. Susie Nelitanam, director from 1986 to 1990. Dr. Mitra Augustin, director 1990 to 1997. Reverend Dr. M.J. Joseph, director from 1997 to 2006. Reverend Dr. Mani Chako, director from 2006 to 2011. Very Reverend Dr. Cherian Thomas, director from 2011 to 2016. Current director is Dr. Father Matthew Chandrakanal. M.A. Thomas Sachin, as I have read through his books, and especially leap into the unknown, he speaks about somebody who wanted to connect with the whole cosmos. As he has shown, this center is a place where irrespective of the caste, creed, geography, and sex. A place where people can come and celebrate together the human progress, unity, peace, and harmony. So when he established uh, this uh, center, uh, the first building was the administrative block, where he did not even write his name, and he simply wrote there as a servant of this community has found uh, placed the foundation stone. So that gives the whole vitality and vision uh, of M.A. Thomas Sachin. So I see that his kenosis is the foundation and the underpinning ethos of this center which uh, enables people to come here and to contribute to bringing together peace and harmony in this uh, universe. Now I hope even to those friends who haven't visited ECC may understand a glimpse about ECC. Now we will invite Professor Dr. Matthew Chandran Kunal, the Director of ECC for welcome address. Before we call him, I would like to have a brief, a brief introduction about him. Professor Dr. Matthew Chandran Kunal, the present Director of the Ecumenical Christian Center, belongs to the Carmelite of Mary Immaculate, a Catholic congregation. Serves as a professor of science, science and religion, consciousness studies at Dharmaram Vidya Setram, Christ University, Bangalore. He is also a research guide and an examiner at the Senate of Sarampur College University. And he gives lectures in many universities in India and abroad on various topics. He is very dynamic leader and a great academician. We'll now invite Father Matthew for welcome address. Good evening and cordial welcome to the 28th M.A. Thomas Memorial Lecture. The founder of Ecumenical Christian Center and of the Vigilindia movement. Reverend Dr. M.A. Thomas was a great visionary 
and an activist. For the past 28 years, that is from 1993, after his death, every year we are commemorating the great vision, the great humanist, the activist who transformed the ecumenical firmament, the political scenario of India and to some extent to the world given contribution so much for connecting religions, churches, cultures, civilizations. And this process of connectivity is continuing through the institutions he had built up. Today, we commemorate this great person through the memorial lecture, human rights and the right to information by a well-known lawyer and activist, Ms. Kishali Pinto Jayavarthane from Sri Lanka. As we are going through all these 28 lectures, we could find that from the very beginning, B.G. Vargis, a very prominent journalist of India, was the first to give the memorial lecture. He was a close friend from his study time from Cambridge John Wits. Though he was such a great visionary and activist, what really happened to the memory of M. A. Thomas, I think it is underdetermined. He has contributed so much, but from our theological and other educational uh, circles, we don't have the continuity and research on Reverend Dr. M. A. Thomas. This is what I have found through these years. Though we have wrote many books, I think the researchers could not find very many valuable sources. So we have collected all the memorial lectures till the last one, 27th, and we have already printed and we will be getting it soon. So this will be a source on the great creativity and activity and the visionary transformation Reverend Dr. M. A. Thomas has given to the wider humanity. The struggles, the tears and the triumphs of Reverend Dr. M. A. Thomas could also be seen in the reports from 1963 onwards. The first beginning was on January 5th, the Epiphany Day. We could also see that it was a semantic epiphany, a meaningful manifestation of the glory of God and also an obedience to Jesus Christ by this humble and simple person, Reverend Dr. M. A. Thomas. Believing in the providence of God, he had, great, he had created from nothingness this great institution of Ecumenical Christian Center, which continues the great visionary activity which he has entrusted to us. Therefore, I have gone through most of his uh, reports, collected them, and also many unpublished articles. So they were all put together in a book form known as Semantic Epiphany, Christian Humanism, and the Methodological Oeuvre of Reverend Dr. M. A. Thomas. Why I do 
this is because that I found that such a great personality was still unknown in the theological circles and other research areas. And these source books will be enabling to place him for the next generation to introduce the great visionary activities he has done. As we are all passing through hard times, the corona is still prevailing upon us and we are in close downs and confined to our own rooms or houses, apartments or institutions. Maybe one can find that this is a crisis, this is a negative effect, but also we can look upon this as a, a positive way that though the whole world was in close down through the internet, it is possible for us to come together. So Ecumenical Christian Center has conducted a number of series of lectures as denoted by our own founder, M.A. Thomas, that bringing laity into this ecumenical movement, we have conducted Bible study, biblical hermeneutics, and biblical spirituality, and more than 200 members were participant, and at least 150 got certificates. We also had Hindu-Christian dialogue for fellowship, uh, Buddhist uh, Christian uh, fellowship, and many other activities in and through the internet Zoom connection. With this, we are capable of bringing together the whole humanity. So there were people who were getting up a very early morning in California and in Europe, there will be uh, the midday and in Asia, it will be uh, in the evening and Australia, New Zealand and other places, it will be uh, in the late uh, evening. So the whole space was together in connectivity and uh, I think though there was crisis, it was also a challenging, um, an opportunity for us. So we tried to do whatever is possible in our ways, but still, as we know that it is all a crisis, everything was closed down. But today we are all coming up together in order to celebrate the life and vision of Reverend Dr. M. A. Thomas. On this auspicious day, once again, I welcome all of you. And especially, we are extremely happy to welcome the chairman of Ecumenical Christian Center, Metropolitan Most Reverend Dr. Theodosius Marthoma. We are happy to say that our own chairman is also the head of the Mahatma Church. In spite of all his uh, duties, involvements, a very uh, serious and so much of involvement and time will be extremely uh, difficult to get, but his grace, I would say that, was paternally blessing us with all his presence, his consultations, and he was always there to be with us, to support us, to guide us, and to bless us. So your grace, most reverend Dr. Metropolitan Tadeusius Marthoma, in the name of Ecumenical Christian Center, and all those who assembled here, I cordially welcome 
your grace to this 28th M.A. Thomas Memorial Lecture. The next I would welcome Ms. Kishali Pinto Jayvarthane, the speaker of the day, the vice chairman of ECC, Dr. Sarasu Esther Thomas will be introducing her specially. Therefore, I will be welcoming this August personality who had done her works in uh, Europe, UK, and also in the Indian subcontinent. So most cordial welcome, Ms. Kishali Pindo Jayvartane, in the name of our beloved chairman, Ecumenical Christian Center, and all those who assembled here. Dr. Sarasu Esther Thomas, a lawyer by profession, but a professor uh, who is totally involved in the academic circles and involved in so many other activities. And we are extremely happy that such a personality is our vice chairman. And she has only brought today's this prominent human rights activist and lawyer, Ms. Kishali Pinto Jayvarthane. Therefore, in the name of Ecumenical Christian Center and all those who are assembled here, I welcome Dr. Saraswati Esther Thomas to this 28th M.A. Thomas Memorial Lecture. I also welcome our uh, treasurer, Mr. M. O. Varghese, all the other executive committee members, the council members, our, be our benefactors, our friends, and all well-wishers of ECC and Reverend Dr. M. A. Thomas. So on this auspicious day, without the presence of these participants, it will be extremely difficult to organize such a program. And we have people from all over the world and especially from India. So I welcome dear supporters and well wishers of ECC and Reverend Dr. M. A. Thomas Achen. I welcome all of you to this 28th M.A. Thomas Memorial Lecture. Wishing you all a fruitful time and the ECC uh, leaders, Deputy Director Tang Milun Wi-Fi and Reverend Sukumar and Yasinda and all the others who are supporting today's program, welcoming all of you and thanking our support team. I welcome all of you to this 28th M.A. Thomas Memorial Lecture, and I remain and wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank Father Matthew for the introductory remarks and welcome address. We'll now invite Professor Dr. Sarasu Esther Thomas to introduce the speaker. Uh, Professor Dr. Esther Sarasu Esther Thomas is the vice chairperson of the ECC, as Father mentioned. He's a professor of law at the National Law School of India University, Bangalore. Began teaching the law at the National Law School since 1996. Her areas of focus are gender, women rights, and family law. She is the former registrar and currently holds the position of coordinator 
Congress of Women and the Law. and human rights lawyer, Rozak. We now invite her to introduce the speaker. A very good evening, good morning, good afternoon uh, to everyone uh, gathered here, uh, friends of the ECC community, and uh, especially our uh, guests for today. It gives me a great pleasure to introduce uh, Kishali Pinto Jayavardina to everyone who's gathered here. Kishali is the first and current commissioner uh, of the Right to Information uh, Commission of Sri Lanka. Uh, she's been in this post since 2016. Uh, I have known Kishali for a while and uh, Kishali has worn multiple hats as a lawyer, as a journalist and as a human rights defender. She graduated with honors from the Faculty of Law uh, from the University of Colombo. And uh, since then, she's had a, you know, a long innings, as they say. She's been a public interest attorney in the field of public law. She appeared in several landmark cases relating to the freedom of expression and contempt of court before the Supreme Court of Sri Lanka, as well as international tribunals. Kishali is a prolific writer, along with journalistic and editorial contributions for which she is well known in the Sunday Times of Colombo and in publications of the Law Society Trust. She has contributed greatly to the field of law in areas including uh, the rule of law, contempt of court, uh, gender discrimination, uh, and of course, uh, the right to information. Uh, she has several uh, chapter contributions and book contributions uh, in these different areas by different publications. There is one on contempt of court, the Prashant Bhushan case, uh, which is from the University of Colombo, uh, on the RTI, uh, the fruits of long and hard labor by Routledge. Uh, there is, uh, you know, embattled media from the Institute of Commonwealth Studies and so on. I will just add her publications in a little bit to the chat box. So those of you who would like to uh, read up or follow up or order some of them, uh, you may do so. Uh, Kishali has led multiple human rights research initiatives in many different fields for a number of organizations. And as the director, Ecumenical Christian Center has pointed out, these are not necessarily only in Sri Lanka, but all over the world, in Europe, and in uh, the subcontinent as well. Uh, these include the Institute of Commonwealth Studies, the UNDP, the United Nations Development Program, uh, and the International Commission of Jurists, among others. Kishali, for her work, has been awarded a number of very prestigious fellowships. Uh, she has received uh, and has been the Salzburg Fellow. She has been the Viscom scholar of peace. She has been the distinguished visitor of uh, the Australian National University, Canberra. And in two years, in 2014 and 2016, uh, she was nominated by the Editors Guild of Sri Lanka for the D.R. Vijay Vardhane Award. Kishali has deeply impacted the legal landscape of Sri Lanka with her work on drafting committees, uh, which made laws relating to the right uh, of information legislation in Sri Lanka, culminating in uh, the Right to Information Act in 2016. She has also drafted legislation on contempt of courts for the Bar Association of Sri Lanka. She currently continues to, along with her responsibilities in Sri Lanka, serve as an independent expert on the working group on the Commonwealth Media Principles at the Commonwealth Secretariat in London, the Global Prevention Project uh, in New York, the Advisory Board Media Law Program in uh, the University of Arizona, United States, and is a contributing scholar to the Australia Myanmar Group of Constitutional Scholars, University of New South Wales. Her work at the Commission, I think, has especially opened up new avenues for realization of 
uh, human rights in Sri Lanka. And this evening, we look forward to learning more about this in today's memorial lecture. So once again, a very warm welcome to all of you and a very warm welcome to Kishali. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sarasu, for introducing to us this evening's speaker. And now we will invite the Metropolitan Before we invite Metropolitan Ivysus, we'd like to introduce in a brief way, His Grace, the most Reverend Dr. Theodosius Marthoma Metropolitan is the head of the Marthoma Church and the chairperson of the Ecumenical Christian Center. His Grace was consecrated as Episcopa on December 9, 1989. From 1973 onwards, his grace was in charge of several parishes, including Mumbai, Santa Cruz, Kolkata, parishes in Canada, and Rochester in USA. He served as the first director of Thomas Mar Athanasius Orientation Center, Manganam. On consecration as the Piscopa, he was given charge of Kunankulam Madras Diocese. He was the Episcopa of the Kunankulam Malaba, Hiruvananthapuram Kolam, Chennai, Bangalore, Malaysia, Singapore, Australia, North America, Europe dioceses. He is presently the diocesan bishop of the Niranam, Maramun, Mumbai, and Rani Nilakal dioceses. On July 12th, 2020, His Grace was given the title, the Suffragan Metropolitan during the service at Pulatin Chapel officiated by the Metropolitan, the most Reverend Dr. Joseph Marthoma in the presence of the bishops, clergy and laity of the church. On November 14, 2020, Irumini was installed as the 22nd Marthoma Metropolitan with the title Theodosius Malthoma Metropolitan. The installation service was held at Dr. Alexander Mar Thoma Malia Metropolitan Smakara Auditorium, Zirvala. We are indeed proud of Tirumani for his able leadership and dynamism. We now invite Tirumani for the presidential address, and Tirumani will preside over the lecture. Over to you, Tiramani. The name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Respected Metropolitans, all the bishops, revered clergy, distinguished guests, as Kishali, all the ECC executive members, distinguished guests, friends, and benefactors of ECC family members of M.A. Thomas Sachin. Greetings and welcome to the 28th M.A. Thomas Memorial Lecture. Ecumenical Christian Center is known through the founder, late Reverend Dr. M.A. Thomas. He had a very humble beginning. His parents moved from place to place with the mission of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he had the exposure to a pluralistic and interreligious world. He grew up with the freedom struggle of 1940s and understood well the role of secularism in a plural society. He realized early enough the need for people of both different religious faiths and secular theologies to work together in upholding the values of democracy, freedom, and secularism as most essential in our public life. Dr. Thomas had a broad vision of ecumenism, and he defined it in Asian and Indian terms. He upheld the frontier movement aspect of ecumenism, 
which went beyond the structures of the church, seeking new frontiers. Professor Nainan Koshi summed up thus, for M.A. Thomas, solid Christian faith, critical allegiance to the denomination to which he belonged, clear concepts about the unity of the church and the unity of humankind, creative interaction with people of other living faiths, the cause for justice, all were part of his ecumenism. Through his life and example, Dr. M. A. Thomas taught this ecumenism. Both ECC and Vigil India are instruments for the ecumenical vision as he saw it. This year's theme, advancing human rights, using right information in tough times, is very apt for these times. And through this presidential address, I have two responsibilities, giving a cut and razor to the theme and also creating interest in the forthcoming lecture. The beauty of God's creation is that when God created humans, he has given two means for the best existence, rights and responsibilities. Rights are necessary to make life rich and responsibilities are necessary to move life as per God's plans. Rights given to humans are the very foundation of abundant and complete human existence. One of the most important human rights is right to information. Importance of right to information. Why the right to information is important? Jesus said to his disciples, if you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Truth gives freedom to understand, make right choices, correct the course, and experience God's blessings in life abundantly. Right to information is the right to know the truth. Hence, the right to information is the most important right as it establishes the right to live in freedom. To realize the importance of the right to information, we must realize that information does not belong to the state, government, or bureaucrats, but to the public. Information is created and collected by the government for the benefit of the public they serve with public money and by civil servants who are paid by public funds. Hence, information cannot be denied to citizens. Information brings about openness, transparency, accountability, and responsiveness in government functioning, which leads to good governance. Enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the rights status as a legally binding treaty obligation was affirmed in Article 19 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. It states that everyone has the right to freedom of opinion and expression. This right includes freedom to hold opinions without interference and to seek receive and impart information and ideas through any media and regardless of frontiers. This has placed the right to access information firmly within the body of human rights law and is linked to respect for the inherent dignity of all human beings. It is crucial for participatory democracy Information is the oxygen of democracy, as without information, 
citizens cannot make informed electoral choices or participate in decision making process the key purpose of right to information is to bring about transparency and openness in government so that citizens are well informed and find ways of engaging with the state to promote accountability and citizen centric development in fact government effectiveness control of corruption voice and accountability are some of the key dimensions of good governance according to kofi annan the seventh secretary general of the united nations good governance is perhaps the single most important factor in eradicating poverty and promoting development in 2005 Indian Parliament passed the Right to Information Act 2005 as a fundamental right under Article 19.1a. As per Justice P. L. Bhagwati, where a society has chosen to accept democracy as its creed of faith, it is elementary that the citizens ought to know what the government is doing. but this act is not just a tool of knowing about government's decisions instead it has more deeper implications our country is ruled by participatory democracy where the governance is of the people for the people and by the people whole aim of the participatory democracy is to nurture life in equality unity availability and justice such nourishing of life is possible only if the participatory democracy has following elements transparency accountability predictability and participation connecting human rights with rights to information is a new and welcome development because it is the information that facilitates freedom justice and equality i remember the government of manmohan singh in india enacted the right to information act and how it enabled many whistleblowers to challenge the corrupt systems and it empowered democracy right to information and fight for human rights are the basic foundations of the functioning of democratic systems and it can only check the dictatorships and authoritarian rules which are still prevailing all over the world so these important constituents elements of our democratic system need to be empowered and efforts are to be made to interlink them for the better future of individual freedom and independence of every nation hence the lecture on human rights and right to information is very relevant today friends we have today a renowned constitutional lawyer with the position of commissioner as the memorial day speaker from our neighboring country sri lanka known for its beauty and nature Ms. Kishali Pinto Jayawardene is a highly qualified constitutional lawyer who got educated and well exposed in Europe, UK and other places and wrote many reputed books on human rights and right to information. Dear friends, I wish you all a great time in listening to a stimulating lecture. May the Almighty bless us all one and every one thank you so i invite the speaker for today dr kisale pinto over to you ma'am thank you most reverend uh, your grace uh, most reverend father matoma uh reverend uh, uh, matthew 
Professor Thomas, uh, colleagues at ECC and friends. Um, I must say that this is a privilege and honor to uh, be invited to deliver the 28th M.A. Thomas Memorial Lecture um, by the ECC. I, was, uh, I had the privilege of visiting the ECC many years ago in Bangalore. Um, and my friendship with Professor Thomas is, of course, of much uh, you know, longstanding uh, duration. Um, and at the time that I made the visit to the ECC uh, Bangalore, I became very curious about, uh, about uh, Reverend uh, M.A. Thomas. And I inquired about him and I read about him. And I realized that this was a very rare humanitarian, a very passionate social justice worker who actually spoke about the downtrodden, the poor and the marginalized. Um, and that, uh, in a sense, uh, spoke very warmly to my heart and to my um, purpose of the work uh, I do in Sri Lanka at that point of time and now as well. Um, and I remember even when I uh, was reading about him uh, many years ago, um, his very, the, the very passion he had in uh, you know, making sure that ordinary people, um, you know, the poor, held their heads and their hearts and their minds up high in the words of uh, the immortal words, as I would say, of uh, Rabindranath Tagore. Um, and I think really, if you look at the calamities that the world is facing now, humanity itself is, a, is at a very critical juncture. Uh, these ideas, these ideals, as it were, are very important for us going forward in Sri Lanka and in India and in other countries across the world. Now, um, really, if you look at the, the, the state of the world, the state of Asia currently, um, you know, we are at a point when we are being told that very uh, values that we once thought were cherished were the most important sacred values in our lives, in our societal functioning. For example, uh, the value of a bill of rights, the value of independent judiciary, um, the value of the media, the free media, uh, the importance of speaking out, the right to expression, the right to information, the right to gather, you know, like-minded people together and to, um, you know, activate ourselves about things we're passionate about. We are being told now that these are values that are no longer needed for a society to thrive and to be prosperous and to go forward. That these are just uh, very uh, liberal values that are of no relevance in the, in the modern world. And I think um, that, that uh, ideology, that very dangerously crippling ideology, if I may call it, has to be met by, you know, not by theory, not by abstract words, not in the dusty forums of the law courts. Uh, you know, though I'm a lawyer, this is something I've seen, the limitations of the law really. Um, it has to be met by social justice warriors of which uh, Dr. Thomas was one. Um, it has been met by going out the streets and, and championing the cause of the poor and the marginalized and informing to them and through practice, really, what the law means and what the law should mean in their lives. And uh, today's topic really speaks to all these values, uh, advancing human rights, right to information in tough times. Um, I would not presume even to talk of the value of the right to information to South Asians. India has had its uh, right to information law 14 years before Sri Lanka. Um, and at, the, at that time in 2003, when our first bill on RTI was uh, drafted, and I was one of the drafting committee, and uh, the cabinet of ministers at the time in Sri Lanka uh, uh, approved the bill, it was put to parliament. But as usual, in again, another manifestation of Sri Lanka's eternal political conflicts, uh, parliament itself was dissolved because of a past struggle between the president and the prime minister and the bill then went to limbo. Now from 2003, 10 years uh, from that point, we had basically an era of darkness. Um, we had a situation where though, um, as many of you may know, there was active fighting in the Northern parts of Sri Lanka between the Liberation Tigers of Chami Dilam and the government of Sri Lanka. Though that uh, conflict uh, came to an end in 2009. Um, there was never actual peace thereafter. There was only the peace within courts of the victor or the vanquished. That can never be, never be peace in that sense. 
Um, so we had a situation where during that period, uh, we had, um, you know, basically a cloud hanging over most of our freedoms, most of our constitutional rights, um, so on and so forth. As many of you again may know, um, Sri Lanka um, at a point of time had the second highest enforced disappearances in the world next to uh, Iraq. And this came about not only as a result of the Northern conflict, but also we had two Southern insurrections in the 70s and in the 80s, where the Southern Sinhalese youth fought against the Sri Lankan government. So as a result of both these conflicts, we were in a situation where the instruments of state terror were very pervasive, were very strong. And, uh, and of course, these are very, 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 very well known. We had enforced disappearances, ex extrajudicial executions. Uh, the, the climate of fear that enveloped, enveloped Sri Lanka during that period is, I think, enormous as a lawyer, as an activist, as a, as, a, as a journalist, as a columnist during that time, uh, this uh, basically spoke to almost all my actions in the public, public sphere. Um, and when you look at the way the people were traumatized, uh, one of the major factors in the traumatizing was the fact of the absence of information regarding what happened to their loved ones, regarding you know, uh, information about their very lives, their, you know, the, the villages they lived in, their communities, so on and so forth. So in 2015, when a new government came into power in Sri Lanka and RTI, right, information was a major plank of the election reform at the time. Uh, we uh, again uh, took part in a, in a renewed fight for RTI in Sri Lanka. And as a result of the struggle in 2016, Sri Lanka's Right to Information Act was enacted by the parliament unanimously uh, by the parliament at the time. Now, uh, basically, if you look at the, uh, if you look at the um, uh, ethos and the climate in which the law was enacted, uh, there are some amazing stories that have come out during that period. Uh, the very day the Right to Information Act was uh, passed in Parliament, uh, a group of 15 mothers went to the police stations in the east of the country, which is predominantly Tamil, Tamil dominated. They were all of Tamil ethnicity. And they went with the Tamil acts in their hands, the Right to Information Act in their hands. They went to the police stations and they said, we want to know what has happened uh, to our children who have disappeared due to the war, due to the ending of the conflict in 2009. And the police officers who were there were predominantly Sinhalese because this was a pattern that was very familiar. You know, you have Sinhalese, young Sinhalese boys being put to serve in the predominantly Tamil uh, uh, stations of the North and the East, that is Jaffna, Trikamadi, Batikalo, so on and so forth. And they did not know Tamil. So when the mothers went to them with the copies of Tamil acts, and they said, we want to know, we have a right to know. We have a right to know where our children, what has happened to our children. Uh, these young Sinhalese boys were very astonished. And they were saying, you know, we can't read this act. We don't know Tamil, we can't read this act. So these mothers had to explain in the little Sinhala they knew the contents of the act to the Sinhalese policeman who had heard about the act. It was very much the news at the time. So they had said, oh, we know there's been an information act that passed by parliament, but we don't know what this act is. We don't know what rights you have to come and ask us for this information, so explain to us. So really at that point, it was quite extraordinary to find this dialogue taking place between the mothers and the police officers, the mothers of Tamil ethnicity and the police officers of Sinhal ethnicity. And these could have been very well their own sons because they were young, you know. And this dialogue led to, you know, things more than the information asked for because the sons, the, the policemen were very curious from what had happened to the sons and the daughters of the mothers and they were talking with them and there was a dialogue there. So really that episode symbolizes the tremendous power of the Right to Information Act, which happened on the very day that the act was passed in parliament. So it's very symbolic, you know, in a sense. And if you look at that whole um, process, you know, the very active uh, communities who have been uh, marginalized and dispossessed for so long, uh, using the Right to Information Act to challenge or to ask questions from state entities. Uh, that is remarkable because for many years, because of the conflict in the North or in the South, Sinhalese, Muslims or Tamils, if you went and ask questions from the state agents, whether it was the army or the police, you could expect represents, rep represents. You know, you could expect some kind of intimidation or 
negative feedback or some kind of you know bad reaction from them. And the fact that this information act gave the mothers and others like them the right to actually ask these questions from state agents was very empowering for them. So we go back to this theme that Reverend Thomas emphasized always, keep your hearts and your minds and your heads up high. Again, as I say, Rabindran Tagore's words, you know. Um, so this was a very, very uh, pivotal example of the, of the way the Right to Information Act was used, I think, in, in Sri Lanka at that time. And it also served as a bridge uh, to, uh, you know, between communities themselves. And as you may know, again, uh, Sinhalese, Tamils, and Tamil and Muslim communities have been driven by ethnic and religious and uh, communal divisions for decades in Sri Lanka. There has been a post-independence history that defined the country, that defined us as, as uh, you know, as, as individuals, as young people growing up in Sri Lanka. So RTI became at a point uh, the bridge at which communities began using the act for similar purposes and realized that what unites them is really much more than what divides them. So for example, uh, 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 isolated village in the north of Sri Lanka in the war conflict, in the war theater as it were earlier, used to use the act in the same way as a southern Sinhala community, you know, which belonged to so-called minor majority community, but had the same problems of marginalization as the minority communities in the north. So it, it you know, whether it was for issues of um, simple utility services, getting the electricity into a village, um, you know, activating the act to ask questions about why certain budgetary allocations passed for building of roads in that area were not had not been used properly. Um, uh, questioning as to why welfare allocations, you know, given by the government to communities were given to some and not to others. Was it through political favoritism or not? These were questions that were commonly asked from the north to the south, and as a result, perhaps in a way um, not not expected, unexpectedly, RTI itself became became a bridge linking communities in the north and the south, and that. I think was a very great um, phenomenon of the uh, of the of the act as it were. Um, and if you look at the various uh, examples or the various ways in which the information act has been used, I mean, to my mind, and as a you know, I've been sitting on the commission for five years now. And this is a this was always something very close to my heart. It was very empowering to watch, uh, you know, ordinary people asking, you know, state very senior state officers before the commission. Um, talking to them in Sinhalese and in Tamil and asking them what they mean by not giving them justice for certain for certain things. Uh, in Sri Lanka, unlike in India, uh, RTI did not come from grassroots movement. Uh, Sri Lanka, we had a you know a group of activists, lawyers, editors, uh, journalists who got together and uh, campaigned for 15 years for this law. Um, so it was not a grassroots movement as such, but. The, once the law was enacted, the way the law was used by people was very much grassroots. So it was used more by ordinary people rather than by uh, the so-called elite in the cities, by the media or by the civil society, which also used the law, but mostly it was used by people who had nowhere else to go than to the right to information and to ask uh, you know, for redress, for relief, for the injustices that they had been suffering. So that was a very powerful experiment, a very powerful exercise of their rights as citizens. Um, so if you look at the way the act has been has been employed in Sri Lanka, you would find uh, that uh, uh, including the highest, at the highest levels of state authority at the president's office uh, level, uh, at the president's office, uh, challenges to uh, certain actions by the president. For example, one particular right to information request concerned uh, the reasons why a website, a news website, a very controversial news website had been blocked. And it came up before the commission, we issued order on that. And then it so transpired that it was blocked on the orders of the president of Sri Lanka. So these were things that came out of the public domain as a result of uh, ordinary citizens using the right to information act. Another example were uh, financial irregularities at the Sri Lankan Airlines, national carrier, Sri Lanka's national carrier. 
There again, you know, certain consequences happen where as a result of information being asked about the certain ag agreements that Sri Lankan airlines had entered into with overseas airline agencies, that information was disclosed and ultimately it led to certain repercussions within the airlines because it was realized that there was certain irregular process in the awarding of those uh, in the awarding of those tenders entering into of those agreements. So all these um, factors really came together to uh, force state agents, to force state entities from the highest to the lowest levels to be more transparent and accountable in terms of their functioning. Uh, very recently, last month, in fact, we had extraordinary victory on RTI because uh, a politician who had been allegedly taking bribes to win the elections, uh, which is very difficult to prove, you know, in the ordinary sense, uh, you can't find the, these, uh, you know, evidence of bribery in that in in that regard. But again, here, in, right information act was used, and uh, information details were got of, of the way he had bribed uh, voters uh, to give him their votes during the elections, that he was unseated on a on a petition that was lodged to the court thereafter. So these were very uh, interesting and really illustrative examples really of the information act being used in a way that went beyond the mere seeking of the information. So somebody may think uh, in a sense, oh, it is really, you know, just, just give information and that's it. It doesn't stop, it doesn't stop there. Uh, in many cases, we have found as a matter of fact that what happens when an information request is lodged, sometimes the commission gives uh, order on appeal or sometimes not. The information is given perhaps even before it comes to the commission. Uh, what happens there is that a, a justice process takes place. It is not only the releasing of the information. For example, somebody may uh, file a request asking what has happened to my complaint that I filed at the police station. So what happens there is that not only is information given about the complaint, but actually the complaint is investigated and its redress is then given as a result. In many cases, a very good example of the information that's been used in Sri Lanka were parents who uh, petition schools asking as to why the children had not been admitted to schools properly. If the procedure, uh, correct procedure had been applied, their children would have been admitted. But, you know, there were irregularities, there was there were sort of um, financial incentive taking place and other children were being admitted, not theirs. So as a result of the right information request being filed, the information came out and their children were then admitted to schools. Um, so there are many, many examples in that way that show uh, that the value of the RTI does not stop at the mere release of the information. One very good example is in the, in the, in the predominantly north central parts of Sri Lanka where the farming communities are and where uh, culverts and uh, tanks, water, water, you know, which, which they farm their lands had not been built properly because they had misappropriated the money, the provincial authorities. Uh, all these villagers came together and they went and asked the state authorities as to what had happened to the money allocations that had been put for them to build their uh, tanks and their roads. And as a result of that, it was found out that uh, they had been misappropriated the officials were dismissed and the tanks were built again, the roads were built again. So these, I think to my mind, show that the, the real value of empowerment and the fact that in this case, this is a law that depends on the people to enforce it. It depends on the people to use it. If the people don't use the RTI law, that law will be, this, will be a complete uh, dead letter in a country. And in Sri Lanka, for, uh, you know, to a, to a to our pride, really, and to our sort of uh, very, um, to our joy, if I may say so, um, the law itself has been used very strongly by the Sri Lankan people across ethnic, uh, communal, religious barriers since the time of the enactment. And, uh, you know, if I may also speak to a little bit on the principles that uh, actually governed the law when we were drafting uh, the law in 2015 and even before. Um, the whole purpose of right information law in that sense was, to our minds, was that there was unfair balance between the state and ordinary person. The state had power, the ordinary person did not have power. So, but the purpose of the information law was to redress that injustice, was to redress that lack of balance. And by that time in 2015, because India had already had its information law for 14 years, and so had other countries around us. We looked at all these examples and we learned from them. We, we took the good, we left out the bad, and we looked at how this law could be 
perhaps a better law than many of the others that we could see around us. So basically at that point, our principle was either the government is agreeable to a good law being given or we don't want a law at all because we said we waited for 15 years to have this law and there was no need to have a bad law coming forward, you know. So we were lucky at the time because we were very persistent and we refused to compromise. And as a result, the RTI law in 2016 uh, was a good law. It was ranked quite high globally. Um, and in the practice also there too, we have found that the practice has been perhaps as good as the law in theory itself. Now, basically what we wanted at that time, again, was to uh, look at the right to information law, the right to information commission as an independent commission. We felt that there should be, the commission should be the, the stepping stone between the citizen and the state. And as a result, we look at the Right Information Commission of Sri Lanka, of which I, I, I was sitting until September, end of September 2021, where a five-year terms, uh, you know, came to an end. Uh, the Right Information Commission of Sri Lanka basically uh, is appointed in a way that is different to the other commissions in South Asia and in also elsewhere in the world. So here, what happens is that there is a nomination process that takes place, where the Bar Association of Sri Lanka, the lawyers, uh, the editors and journalists of Sri Lanka, the media fraternity and civil society, they make their nominations to the state for the appointment of the commissioners. Um, I, I served for five years as a nominee of the Editors Guild of Sri Lanka, that is the, the Tamil Muslim and Sinhala editors uh, in, in the country. So this was the whole process of nomination was not left to uh, the political entity, because we have found that when that is left to the political entity, then in, invariably you do get uh, individuals who uh, perhaps are not as independent as they could be. So there was a very clear thinking in that sense that we must have a commission that's independent. And as a result, the Archer Commission of Sri Lanka also has a huge array of powers, far more than the other commissions. So for example, we have the right to determine fees for the giving of information. So Sri Lanka has almost liberal fee structure in the whole world, really. Uh, in many cases, information is given free. The public authorities cannot demand that uh, the appellant or the requester must pay money to get the information. Uh, in, in our case, the commission can also prosecute. If a public authority does not obey the order of the commission to give information, uh, then the commission has the power of prosecution, not the attorney general, not the state law officer. It's a commission that has the power to go to court against her airing uh, public authority. So in that sense, really, the commission itself has a uh, quite a large um, amount of powers in its hands. And the last five years, we have been exercising the powers very judiciously. Uh, we have managed to uh, embark on a process with the public authorities where we have persuaded them that giving information is really better than not giving it. Uh, one is because you may also save a server jail, jail uh, term if you don't, uh, you know, give a give a give the information. And there, are, the jail term is personal against the officers, so that is also a fairly strong deterrent uh, for them to give the information. So, in that sense, if you look at our record, the commission's record during the last uh, five years, 85% of our of our orders have been to disclose the information. And in many cases, actually, the public authorities have in fact disclosed information. Even in the most controversial cases, we have had the cases ranging from, as I said, uh, you know, uh, uh, basically uh, as to why a website has been ordered to be closed, uh, to declaring the assets of uh, politicians, you know, information about the declaration of assets of politicians, um, to uh, tender irregularities at the highest of state uh, state officers, uh, to very many instances in that way that have exposed the corruption and the lack of transparency at the highest to the lowest levels in a way. But uh, many of our orders actually have been, not many, majority of our orders have been complied with. The only issue has been, I think, common to India and Sri Lanka. We have had huge problems from because of COVID from 2020, where the process of giving our information has actually been interrupted and disturbed in many, many ways as a result of frequent lockdowns, quarantines, so on and so forth. But still, the idea of RTI is very, very strong in people's minds. Now, going forward, I think Sri Lanka and India both face challenges on how to preserve this right. 
the Indian example of using RTI has been a very inspiring example for Sri Lanka. We have used many of the um, uh, instances of uh, reasoning by the Indian uh, Right to Information, the Central, Central Information Commission, by the Indian courts, uh, so on and so forth. But I think one must also acknowledge that going forward, the current challenges that face both India and Sri Lanka in terms of right to information, preserving the gains of right to information are quite formidable. Um, we have seen um, the political establishment, in a sense, kicking back, resisting the right, uh, you know, the rights um, that are being given now to uh, uh, to the citizenry. And I think to actually um, meet that uh, that challenge, to meet that uh, uh, you know the struggle that we see before us. Uh, again, I go back to uh, to Reverend Thomas and the example he set of being a visionary, of being a social justice warrior, of taking the law to the people um, and making the law relevant to the people. I think that should be the foremost uh, task for us going forward in South Asia. Thank you. May, may I request Rumini or Dr. Sarasu to lead us for the Q&A session? Yeah. Of course, uh, thank you uh, so much, uh, Kishali, for that uh, talk and giving us a snapshot of how the right to information has uh, worked in Sri Lanka in uh, bringing about uh, you know, human rights in ways that were not anticipated at all. Uh, we now have... Uh, about, uh, please correct me, Midlon, about 15 minutes for questions and answers. Uh, so uh, if there are, if any of you would like to uh, raise your hand, you may do so, uh, or just type it in chat if you have a question and you're unable to use your speaker. Um, for those of you who are using Zoom for the first time, you can take your mouse right to the bottom you'll find a smiley on the bottom row, which says reactions. If you click on that, the last option at the bottom will be raise hand. So uh, please use the raise hand option to speak. Uh, otherwise, please turn on your video and wave. We will call on you. Uh, Yes, I can uh, see Stephen Abraham is waving his hand first, so yes. I would request you to speak. Yes, um, thank you for giving me this opportunity to ask a question. Um, some time ago, there was a citizen from Kerala who filed a RTI case against the prime minister, and he wanted to know uh, through proof of documentation about the Prime Minister's citizenship of India. So do you know what happened to that case? Thank you. Um, I'm sorry, I wouldn't, uh, I, I, we don't keep uh, track of uh, the Indian uh, cases in that sense, so I'm not personally aware of this uh, uh, request. Uh, as such, uh, I seem I do seem to remember something. I remember uh, requesting fire to ask for the educational qualification of the Prime Minister of India at some point, but uh, the citizenship uh, I cannot quite uh, recall that. Yeah, rather I think the education qualification of the Prime Minister or the citizenship. Uh, I yes, 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 yes. Somebody oh, filed it. Yes, 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 yes. yes. Yes, I, I, uh, there was an information request filed, and I think there was a division in the commission, in the Central Information Commission of India at, the, at that point on that issue. I can't quite remember what actually happened, uh, because I remember the appeal being transferred from one bench to another, uh, and I ultimately did the final order take place or not, I'm not quite uh, sure, really. If I were to add to that, what would happen if a similar situation uh, you know, were to take place in Sri Lanka? Would, would it be easier to get an order from the commission? 
Oh yeah, well yes, because we have actually uh, see the 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 issue would be of course uh, where you file the uh, the application to. So if you file to Parliament, uh, the Parliament in many ways take the take the position that they don't really have the Prime Minister uh, educational qualifications because they don't keep they're not required by law to keep the uh, information with them. But if you file to the Prime Minister's office. There is absolutely no it's unequivocal and categorical that the information ought to be there. So then, and in certain instances, we have in very many instances where uh, education qualifications or politicians are concerned, we have issued orders for them to release the information. I mean, there is not, nothing secret about it. There, there cannot be any overriding secret secrecy element in, giving, in not giving that information. Okay. Uh, thank you for that, uh, Kishali. I uh, see there's a hand raised. Uh, we have the principal of the United uh, Theological College. Uh, Ma'am, good evening. Yeah, good evening. I'm Vasanta Rao, principal of the United Theological College, Bangalore. I want to thank Madam for this presentation, which has been very, very, very edifying. And I'm really happy to see the link between RTI and RTI itself becoming a tool for justice. That is something amazing. Otherwise, which RTI is just an RTI, just an information. And now we realize it is not just a matter of information, but it becomes a tool for justice. And thank you very much by bringing it so forcefully with uh, live examples from your side. Ma'am, thank you. That's all from my side. Thank you so much for your uh, comment. Uh, are there any other questions or comments? Now, while we're waiting for questions, I have another uh, question for you, Kishali, if I may. Uh, what are the what is the kind of what are the kinds of information which the commission has uh, refused to allow to be provided to the public? It's a quite interesting question. Very, very little, actually. <laughs> um, well, uh, what, what have we refused? Um, sometimes in terms of privacy issues, um, when the matter concerns uh, personal details of individuals that are not central to the information being asked, uh, those have actually not been released. Uh, we do have a privacy exemption like in India, Section 51A. Um, and where the overriding public interest is not an issue, then the information has not been released. So, um, but, I mean, well, one example would be uh, the school children I mentioned. There are, though, uh, we release details about which children had been admitted to schools as a result to see the irregularity in the process. Uh, we didn't release the personal details, the addresses, so on and so forth, because that would then be a problem, you know. Uh, in many instances, uh, medical reports of uh, people have not been uh, had, have not been ordered to be released. Um, again, with regard to uh, deeds uh, of land, uh, those have not been released to third parties because of obvious concerns regarding again the possibility of those deeds being forged, uh, so on and so forth. Um, so, that, so really, I think in a, in a way, the very narrow concerns of uh, privacy uh, in instances where national security has been invoked by the government, uh, we have been very uh, categorical in um, examining the information that is denied and then deciding for ourselves whether the information can be uh, denied or not. Uh, in Sri Lanka, the commission has a power to inspect the information themselves. So the public authority refuses to give the information, we can call for the information, inspect it ourselves to see whether the public authority's refusal is justified or not. So for example, in a, in a very high profile case of uh, uh, you know, um, uh, procurement and uh, irregular tenders, you know, where money was paid for the construction of the defense headquarters in Sri Lanka, uh, there the government and the attorney general came before the commission to say that in fact, they cannot release the information to the national security. And uh, in, our, in, in, in that instance, what we said was, well, uh, what seems to be an issue here is not so much national security, but more a procurement issue. 
So we need to see that information that, uh, that was asked for, that was a cabinet subcommittee report relating to the irregularities and the uh, payment of uh, monies um, in an irregular way to the architectural constructor of the particular headquarters building. So we examined that, inf that information, that cabinet subcommittee report, and we found that there was nothing concerning national security in that. So we, we ordered that to be released, and the cabinet complied with that particular order, but, and this goes to your point, uh, Sarasu, but in the annexions to the cabinet subcommittee report, there were diagrams of the defense headquarters uh, in issue. So that showed the way you can access the headquarters, how you can exit the headquarters, the strength of the troops in the headquarters that could be accommodated at a particular point of time. And that diagram we withheld because what the, the logic there was, the diagram was not uh, relevant or essential for the uh, showing that, that something irregular had happened in the procurement process. Number one, number two, in any event, that was a matter of security and could not be released. So uh, in certain instances, because the act gives the power to the commission to order reduction, to sever one information and give the rest, you know, withhold one part and give the rest, we have used that and the powers of inspection strongly uh, to call for and examine documentation denied by the public authority and then release or uh, part release as the case may be. Uh, thank you for that. Are there any other questions? As I said, either wave on your video uh, or you can scroll down, use the reactions. That's a smiley down there. Click it and raise your hand or please put your questions in chat. Okay, there's a question. Let me just read it out. How has RTI contributed to easing of ethnic conflict in uh, Sri Lanka? Yes, so I think I answered that in a sense in my presentation because I spoke about the way it has uh, been used by different communities, uh, you know, from the north to the south for the same things as it were. And in many instances, we have found villagers getting together, you know, Sinhalese uh, and Tamil and Muslim villagers getting together and combining their information requests because many of the times the problems that affect them have been very common. Uh, so as I said, you know, more unites them than divides them as they have found, because it's always the problem with the, with the marginalized, with people who don't have power. People who have power, if you go, if you come to Sri Lanka and you ask the middle class, what is RTI, they won't have a clue because RTI is, is not, has not been relevant to the middle class because the middle class has their own, they have their own power of mechanisms. They have their own way of getting information. They have their, tap-ins to uh, government sources, to the power establishments. But RTI has been very relevant and used very much by the poor and the poor of Sinhalese, Muslim or Tamil ethnicity. Um, so in a sense, as I said, that has acted as a bridge between communities in Sri Lanka, much more I think than in other countries really, given that this is also a small country as it were, uh, it has been used quite effectively by communities for the same thing. Uh, thank you, Madam, for uh, giving a very updates of uh, uh, right to know the information. It's really, uh, it's a really a thought-provoking comments and uh, talk. I think the right to this is an added advance to the uh, to boost up the democracy, the rule of law, and even the knowledge of democracy and everything. So my query is that you know, of course, uh, uh, getting some information from a concerned office. Uh, you know, of course, it is good, but that information leads to formation and the transformation in the society. So, uh, mm -hmm. you know, from uh, from a serial context, you know, how do you comment that? You know, this kind of a, uh, you know knowing process is taking place only in the uh, educated class or the common class or middle class. Of course, you know, it is a, whether it is mm -hmm. a. Uh, getting down to the uh, the common people, unless uh, you know. Uh, so, what is the ratio of um, uh, the uh, in a avail, how how far the people are availing, and how much percentage of the people are availing yes. this kind of um, uh, information? And even even it is seemed to be yes. enigmatic. From Indian context, if you are sending uh, some data, you know we are also uh, puzzled to understand any after effects or any cross checking or something like that whether the application will be confident there or still it is enigmatic in the public 
so even educated community mm-hmm. also not utilizing it even though it's, uh, of course uh, you know since we don't have a referendum like australia or other things you know it, this mm-hmm. this is a, a as a bonus we received recently but uh, how far the people are according mm-hmm. to your uh, knowledge and experience how far the people are availing it or still it is uh, uh, in a compartmentalized uh, uh, in its uh, in a process stage or uh, whether it's having a vibe or not thank you mm. that's a very good question well actually rti in sri lanka is of course just 5 years old so we are a very young right to information regime um but if you look at the if i look at the commission for example the last 5 years the appeals that have come to us have been perhaps 75% from ordinary people and 25% really from the you know the so called elite or the educated or the colombo candy you know the the city that it were uh, the majority of appeals that have come to the commission are really from the grassroots or from the ordinary people um, but that said yeah, i agree i mean uh, you know the information has to be transformational otherwise it becomes uh, a very mechanical you know uh, process um and i think uh, sri lanka has a long way more to go in that regard in india itself though it has been used quite strongly as you say uh, it is still yet to reach certain segments of the people and still yet to become a transformational force um in our case because our past has been so dire and so fraught full of tensions full of communal you know conflict uh if you know they say when you are drowning a man or a woman as the case may be will reach out for any straws you know so it is from that level of fairly low expectations that uh, we are happy because at least this is there and people are using it um to look beyond that for a transformational impact on society we will take i think a decade or more and again that uh, depends the extent to which it becomes rti becomes Uh, a part of the common discourse uh, of people you know uh, becomes part of their lives uh, in certain instances it has become part of their lives you know uh, if you look at the way certain communities have used rti but as i said there's a long way more to go for that so one can only pray and hope that uh, that will happen uh, in the years uh, in the years uh, you know into the future um again i go back to my point you know you need social justice warriors particularly something like right to information cannot be just a law that will be you know implemented either by a commission or in a court uh, it has to be taken to the communities to the collective consciousness of the people or the populace but one thing is for sure uh, in sri lanka even though um, we have had the law for only 5 years uh, and though we have had a change in government in 2019 uh the right to information process has really gone on un- uninterrupted we have had no interruptions of that uh, process uh, you know either at, on the at the commission level or at a wider level so to some extent that shows that the government itself the new government or the la- to the government of the last two years uh, has realized that rti has been acknowledged by the people as being of value for them which is why they have not interfered with it too much um so i think that speaks to the to the good of rti but going forward it is a question as to what will happen to it so that will all depend on how people use it and how people allow it or or, or make it transform their own lives and the communities uh, thank you for that uh, kishali uh, let me now just check with minlun uh, are we out of time Yes ma'am we can wait okay. if there is no other questions Yeah we thank the speaker Ms Kesalik Pinto for such an illuminating and enlightening talk and also we thank Dr Sarasu for leading us in the Q&A session we now invite uh Reverend Sukumar Babu the program executive of ECC to propose word of thanks indeed it's a great honor for me to express the gratitude of word of thanks on behalf of ecumenical christian center first of all i thank god for god's abundant grace upon our ecumenical christian center to organize 
this amazing and exciting 28th M.A. Thomas Memorial Lecture in a successful way. I thank God who has been faithful despite all the challenges with COVID-19 pandemic. I also thank the life and witness of the founder of Ecumenical Christian Center, Reverend Dr. M.A. Thomas Achin, for his bold vision and sacrifice for wider humanity, equality, and justice. With immense gratitude and due respect, I sincerely express our profound thanks to the dynamic and inspirational speaker, Dr. Kishali Pinto Jaywardena, who is highly respected around the world for her wealth of knowledge and wisdom. Thank you so much, ma'am, for your outstanding lecture on advancing human rights using the right to information in tough times. In fact, your presentation was excellent and thought provoking. You have ignited, energized, and illuminated our minds to think beyond the boundaries in the light of advancing human rights. Thank you very much indeed for take, taking us to various dimensions, perspectives of human rights in Sri Lankan context, Indian context, and the context of other countries as well. Let me express my profound gratitude to our chairman of Ecumenical Christian Center, the most reverend doctor, His Grace, Metropolitan Theodosius Marco Makirmani, also the head of the Malankara Marthoma Syrian Church for your humble, dynamic and inspirational leadership with uncompromised vision towards wider humanity. We're extremely delighted to work under your leadership. We are fortunate and blessed to have you as the chairman of Ecumenical Christian Center. Thank you very much, Thirmani, for gracing this 28th M.A. Thomas Memorial Lecture with your outstanding presidential address on rights and responsibilities of the life of Reverend Dr. M.A. Thomas Hitchin and right to access information for human dignity and the importance of transparency, accountability, predictability, participation, eradicating poverty, and promoting development, freedom, justice, and equality. Thank you very much, Indeed Thirmani, for your thought-provoking presidential address. Thank you. I also express my deep gratitude to our Director of Ecumenic Christian Center, Professor, Father Dr. Matthew Chandranakunnel CMI, for your profound and outstanding leadership to lead ECC into greater heights. Your dedication and hard work are highly appreciated. Your creativity and patience and wisdom have shaped ECC into new directions. In fact, Professor Father Dr. Matthew Chandranakunnel CMI made profound impact by initiating creative conferences and workshops with the Buddhist philosophy, Hinduism, science, technology, agriculture, education, and artificial intelligence, and the list goes on. Thank you very much indeed, Father, for your profound administrative leadership towards Ecumenical Christian Center. I sincerely thank Professor Dr. Sarasu Esther Thomas, Vice Chairperson of Ecumenical Christian Center, for your commitment and dedication towards Ecumenical Christian Center. In fact, today's speaker, Dr. Kishali Pinto Jaywardhani, was kindly brought by Professor Dr. Sarasu Esther Thomas. Thank you very much, ma'am, for bringing such an eminent and dynamic scholar into our midst. Thank you very much indeed for moderating the interactive session and for all your contribution towards Ecumenical Christian Center. I sincerely thank our treasurer of Ecumenical Christian Center, Yombo Varghese, sir, for your dedication and commitment towards ECC. Thank you so much for all your support and massive guidance. We are really grateful for you. Thanks a lot, sir, for your outstanding contributions. Thank you so much, indeed. I thank all the members of the Executive Committee for your continuous support and interactions with the Ecumenical Christian Center. I thank Deputy Director Tang Minjun Weipei for his massive support in technical and administrative skills to run this 28th M.A. Thomas Memorial Lecture in a successful way. I also thank Mrs. Elizabeth Menlun, who is a digital artist who designed all the posters in a meticulous and creative manner. Huge thanks to both of you. I thank Mr. Akil Jose, our accountant, for his continuous support and dedication towards the Ecumenical Christian Center. Thank you so much, Akil. My thanks also goes to our receptionist, Jacinta Baskar, for your massive support. I also thank all the supporting staff in Ecumenical Christian Center, 
especially our electrician in ECC by name Arul Das for his kind support. I also recognize the presence of previous directors of Ecumenical Christian Center, Reverend Dr. M. G. Joseph, Reverend Dr. Mani Chapo. Thanks a lot, Achins, for joining with us. I recognize the presence of previous staff members of Ecumenical Christian Center, Dr. Matthew George Chunakara, the present General Secretary of Christian Conference of Asia, Dr. Arunad Nanadasan, Dr. John Sommel Poniswamy. Thank you very much indeed for joining with us. I recognize the presence of our focal area friends, Carolyn Pusitil and uh, Dr. Justin, acting registrar of the Senate of Sarapur, our director's friend, Dr. Emmanuel Selvaraj, Professor Reverend Dr. Shanti Thomas, and Colonel John Prabhukumar from Salvation Army. Thank you very much indeed for joining with us. I also recognize the presence of a principal of the United Theological College of Bengaluru, Reverend Professor Dr. Chilkuri Vasantra, and the principal of Gurukul Lutheran Theological College and Research Institute, Chennai, Reverend Dr. Songram Basmatri, and the ABS principal, and Reverend Dr. Balakrishnan, principal of SIBS. There are a number of highly eminent scholars, priests, students, professors, friends, you know, met virtually in this exciting 28th M.A. Thomas Memorial Lecture. Thanks to all of you for joining with us virtually. Your presence has made a huge impact in this webinar. Let us continue to carry the vision of founder of the Ecumenical Christian Center, Reverend Dr. M.A. Thomas Achin who had a complete obedience to Christ and wider humanity that all human beings are equal and created in God's image. Thanks to all of you. Thank you. Blessings for the train. God be with everyone. Thanks a lot for participating. Thank you, Vidal.